Lesson number 24, Understanding Your Religion, the major, seven major doctrines that define the Christian faith, and this last uh, lesson in the series entitled The Doctrine of the Second Coming, Part Two. Just too much material to do it in one shot. Okay, so one last look at our chart containing the major doctrines leading up to the seventh and final doctrine, which is the second coming of Christ. Let me throw up our chart. There's the chart that we've been working with. There's the entire course, the entire 24 lessons are right there on uh, that chart. Major, the seven major doctrines, inspiration of the Bible, deity of Christ, original goodness, the fall of man, reconciliation of man with God. And then I said, right, we stopped at reconciliation and we said under reconciliation, 10 sub-doctrines. And sub-doctrines number one to five, election, predestination, atonement, redemption, regeneration, those five sub-doctrines are really the plan of salvation, God's plan to save man. And then we said, uh, sub-doctrines number six to 10 under reconciliation was um, uh, a view of that plan of salvation from different perspectives. The human perspective, the legal perspective, heavenly, inward, eschatological perspective, meaning you know, how the plan of salvation looks when it's finally uh, completed. Then there was the doctrine of the, the kingdom of God, and I said that the kingdom of God uh, on earth is going to be joined to the kingdom of God in heaven when Jesus returns. That's, that's what's going to happen. Okay? And His return will also mark the end of this world and the beginning of the new heaven and the new earth. So chronologically, this is the last doctrine, meaning the, the doctrine of the second coming. It's the last doctrine on the list because it teaches us what happens at the end of the world and how to be ready for the event. So it's naturally the seventh and then last of the major doctrines. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus provides teaching about His second coming, mainly in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, uh, which we covered last week. Uh, he also mentions the end of the Jewish nation in the book of Mark, but he just talks about the end of the Jewish nation uh, in the book of Mark and gives several warnings um, uh, to, uh, uh, to his disciples to be prepared for his return. And he talks about that in Luke and in John, mostly in the form of parables and prayers. Okay? Jesus talks about his return. But the, 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 the meat of the teaching that Jesus gives is in Matthew 24. You know, the apostles ask him, you know, when, when, will, when will the temple be destroyed? You know, when will these things happen? When will your return be? So there's a long passage there which we talked about. Uh, Peter also refers to the end times briefly uh, uh, in Acts chapter 3, 19 uh, and 21. And in his letters, uh, there is one long passage, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 13. And uh, mainly, he warns of the suddenness and the finality of the events when Jesus returns. And he also adds the manner in which the world will be destroyed, and that is intense heat. And he finishes with a warning again to be ready. All the apostles, when they're talking about you know, the, 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 the coming of Christ, you know, they always give that warning. So you better be ready. You don't know when it's going to happen, but you need to be ready. Uh, one interesting thing too, none of the teachers exhort their disciples or the Christian disciples to try to figure out when the end is going to be. Contrary to so much of the preaching about the end times that we hear today on TV and in books and so on and so forth. Jesus or the apostles, the only advice that they gave to the disciples concerning the end is be ready because you don't know when it's going to come. Don't even waste any time trying to figure it out. You don't know. There are also brief mentions of the second coming in Hebrews and in James, as well as in the book of Revelation. And I'm mentioning these things simply because I'm not going to be covering all these passages today in this lesson. Just don't have time. I just want you to know that the, the, the second coming is mentioned in different epistles, different writers, okay? As I say, a brief mention in Hebrews, uh, and James as well in Revelation. Now in the book of Revelation, John deals mostly 
with the plight of the early church under the persecution of Rome. Uh, I know that other groups kind of use Revelation as their, you know, uh, as their text to talk about the end of the world, but uh, we believe that uh, uh, John is talking about the end of the Roman Empire, the end of the persecution, so on and so forth. And John describes his vision of the heavenly realm after the end of the world, but he doesn't provide any information about what actually happens at that historical moment when Jesus returns and the world as we know it ends. So I know a lot of, there are a lot of books out there that talk about they, they marry the end of the world and revelation, but that's not where you're going to get information about the actual, hist what happens at the, end of, at the end of the world. This particular task, what happens exactly, historically, okay, at the end of the world, this task is left to Paul, Paul the Apostle, who refers to the end of the world and Jesus returns in nine of his 13 epistles. So he really talks about the second coming of Jesus the most. That's why I'm going to focus on him in this last lesson. So let's go through uh, what Paul says and list the things that he says about what will happen at the end of the world when Jesus returns. Again, don't have the time in the brief half hour to just take every scripture and you know, break it down, but at least I'll, I'll summarize what he says and we'll list the uh, passage. All right, you ready? So we begin in the book of Romans. Romans chapter two, verse five, and Romans 12, verse, uh, 12 to 16. Um, uh, Paul says that uh, the, when, when Jesus comes, it'll be a time when God will judge and punish. Uh, Romans 8.23, he says that our bodies will be redeemed, meaning we will be resurrected. In Romans 14.10-12, he says that each person will have to give an account to God. That goes at the second coming. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1.8, he tells us that Jesus will come for His own. 1 Corinthians 5.5, he says the second coming will be a day for destruction or salvation depending on our lives lived in faith or not. Did you live in faith or not? Were you faithful or were you not faithful? Not were you perfect or were you not perfect, were you faithful? You know, I always say the key, encourage, the key encouragement idea in Christianity is I was faithful despite my imperfection. I was faithful despite my mistakes. I was faithful despite the burden of my sinful flesh. I was faithful, I hung in there, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 28, he says, all beings will be in their proper place with perfect unity reestablished between God and man forever. It's a mouthful. I mean, we just talk about that. But he mentions that in 1 Corinthians 15. Also, verse 51 to 54, he says, all the events, the resurrection, the glorification of the saints, the punishment of the wicked, the destruction of the old creation, the, uh, the old creation and the creation of the new heavens and earth, and everything that happens that, are, that is described in all the different places in the New Testament, all of the events <coughs> happen in the twinkling of an eye. It's not, you know, for so many years this happens, and for a thousand years that happens, and then for another 400 years this happens, and then that happens, no, no, no. All these events, they happen in the twinkling of an eye. You're here, you're doing your business, and then boom, it's over. No time for apologies, change. That's why he says be ready. You, believe me, he says, believe me, you will not know. You won't know when it happens. So just be ready, that's all. Okay, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, the Holy Spirit working in us gives us an idea what it will be like when we will have glorified bodies when Jesus comes to raise us up. Another idea, wow. So we get a taste of it, a little taste. When do we get that little taste? Well, when we're in the Spirit and we're praying and we're in the Spirit, or when we're reading God's Word and we see something that is so clear, so crystal clear, we've never understood it like that before. We wish we could just freeze that moment and stay in that moment, but of course we can't, right? The phone rings, we've got to go to the bathroom, you know, you know what I'm saying? The flesh interferes. 
or we're getting along with a brother or sister, or you know what I mean, we're having a moment there, just that perfect unity. The Spirit leads us through all these experiences just to give, just to give us that little taste. Second Corinthians 5.10, he says, we will be judged for our deeds. Again, what's the only deed that really counts? I confessed Christ. <laughs> That's the deed that I'm going to, and you're going to be judged on. You know, there's this dichotomy. We think, well, I'm a Christian and I'm being faithful, but I'm going to be judged for my deeds. Well, yeah. Yeah, the only deed that counts for us is that we believed in Christ and we confessed His name and we, we were baptized and we, we lived a faithful light, life despite our problems, despite our burdens. Yeah, th those are our deeds. And the ones that didn't do that, they're going to be judged on their deeds. Okay, so try not to confuse those two. Let's go to Philippians. Oh, I went to Philippians already. Um, let, me, let me go back here just a second. No, 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 forget it. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, he says, we will be transformed into glorious bodies similar to his own when he returns. Why, why the trans, uh, transfiguration? Why that passage, the transfiguration? Well, to give us an idea, a visual idea of what we will be like. We're going to be like Him. And for a brief moment, He shows us what His glorified body looks like to a certain extent. And Paul says, we're going to be transformed into that glorified body. Then in Thessalonians, chapter one, verses, uh, uh, chapter, yeah, chapter three rather, verses 11 to 13, he says, the minister's task is to prepare the church towards a loving heart for the return of Jesus. In other words, to prepare the hearts of the church that they be ready. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, uh, once again, he says, the return of Jesus will be completely unexpected. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, now I've got that slide up. We'll read this one here because there's a lot of information here. So he says, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Too much there to, to summarize, we had to read it. So what's he saying here? Of course, we know the problem, right? Thessalonians, they were being upset by teachers who were saying, you know, the Lord's already come, and uh, some of them were being upset because uh, they were anticipating that Jesus was going to come right away during their lifetime, and then some of the Christians began to die off. And they were thinking, well, wait a minute, the Christians who died, what about my, you know, my grandpa, my mom, you know, is she going to just stay in the ground? When the Lord comes to take me, are they going to leave her behind? That was the kind of question they were asking Paul. So Paul is responding to this fear and these questions. So what does he say? Well, he says, when Jesus returns, those who are dead in Christ, they'll be resurrected first. Then those who are alive when He comes will join the resurrected ones, and both of these will be transformed and be with Christ in the new heavens and earth. Now I want you to note something very important here. Notice that neither Jesus nor the saints are on the earth. That means there's no 1,000 year reign here on the earth. Why? It says when He comes, the dead in Christ will rise, the ones who are alive in Christ will join them, and they will be with the Lord in the air. Not on the earth in another dimension, not in this dimension. Why? Because this dimension here is going to be destroyed. So once Jesus appears, it's the end of the old. 
the wicked and the unbelieving are punished, the world is destroyed, the new heaven and earth established with God and Christ and the Spirit and the saints all united, and all of it, as I say, happens in the blink of an eye. There's no you know, parsing out, there's a thousand years and then there's another resurrection, then there's the great battle of Armageddon and then there's the this and then they reestablish the temple and then the, we're going to get the Jews to be saved. And you know, have you ever seen a chart of this? You know, it's so complicated, you need an engineering degree to figure it out. It's, I, I, I'm not saying it's simplistic, but, it, but I like to go to Thessalonians to explain what happens at the end of the world because Paul is a very structured kind of a guy in his mind, you know, and it's just this happens, that happens, this happens, that happens. This is the order that it happens in. Easy for us to understand. All right, let's go to um, sec, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. He says, now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. And I'm sure that that passage has great meaning for a certain person in this room this morning. <clears throat> so 1 Thessalonians 5.3, so all of this will happen. No signs, no warnings. How many times do they have to say it? No sign, no warning. Actually, the only warning given to us is to be ready at all times because you won't see it coming. Peace and safety, peace and safety, meaning isn't that what the world is always looking for? Peace, peace among the nations, no war, safety, so we could all live quietly and raise our families. You know? The world will be pursuing peace and safety. And in the middle of all of that, boom, it's over. All right, let's go to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. He says, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was belief. So in 1 Thessalonians, he talks about what's going to happen to the saints. You know, the dead in Christ will rise, those who are alive will be gathered. With, you know, that's what's going to happen to the saints. Then in 2 Thessalonians, he talks about what's going to happen to the wicked. Okay? What's going to happen to the wicked? Because the wicked have been persecuting the Christians. And the Christians are saying, yeah, but that's, that's all well and good when he returns, but what about now? Look, you know, those guys are they're persecuting us. We're suffering. And so uh, Peter, uh, Paul is saying, don't worry, the time will come when the judgment will come. Okay? Somebody says to you, what about the injustice in the world? What about the Hitlers and the, the, Mao, the Mao Zedongs and, 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 and these, 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 these dictators who have been responsible for the murder and the death of millions and millions? Of, what about them? You know? Go to 2 Thessalonians. That's about them. That's what's going to happen to them. Okay, so those who, uh, those who didn't believe will know why they are being punished. And those who have been faithful will enjoy the fact that their faith will finally be justified and rewarded. Don't worry, he says. You'll have that moment where you're going to feel and understand, boy, am I ever glad that I believed. I knew it was true. I, just, I always knew it was true. Now he goes on to talk about the same, you know, the, um, the second coming in Timothy. This is the seventh epistle, by the way. First Timothy 6, 14 and 15 uh, says that Jesus will actually appear in real time, historical time, not just a vision, not a dream, real time. And His return is not a spiritual metaphor. At the right time, in other words, on a Tuesday, let's just say, on a Tuesday at at 2.07 and 15 seconds, you know, February 2084, you know, you know what I'm saying, it, real time. I'm not predicting that, I'm just saying real time, He will appear to those who are alive 
at that moment. It's not a vision thing, it's not a metaphor thing, it's a history thing. Just like his death is a history thing, not a metaphor, not a, you know, it's not a tale or a fable, it's a real thing. We, we can pinpoint the day, the time, the hour, the day, the time, the hour he rose from the dead, the day, the time, the hour he ascended into heaven, and the day, the time, the hour he's going to return. Okay. Number eight, which is 2 Timothy, chapter four, verse one and eight. He says that the coming of Christ will not only bring an end to this world and punishment, but also a great reward for the faithful. And then, believe it or not, in Titus, he talks about the end times. Titus 2, verse 11 to 13. He explains that we, we prepare for His sure return by living godly lives now. The more godly our lives, the greater hope we have and joy we will have when He appears. So those are the, I, you know, I may have missed some, but I believe those are the references that he makes, that Paul makes throughout his writings to the second coming of Christ. Okay, I want to switch gears here. Um, there are four main views or four main teachings within Christian, Christendom, four main doctrines concerning the return of Jesus, and I'd like to summarize these four for you. Number one is called dispensational premillennialism. Dispensational premillennialism. People who believe this doctrine believe in the literal interpretation of the prophetic passages concerning the end times. So for example, when they talk about the thousand year reign, dispensational premillennialists believe that's a, actually a thousand year, year number one, number two, number three, number four, it's not symbolic, it's, it's actual real time. You know, the, the, the dragon's a real dragon and the, you know, they, everything is literal. Some of the features of this position, as I say, an actual thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth will be established. Remember why I said it was important in 1 Thessalonians when, when Paul says we'll be with Him in the air? There's no talk about Him reestablishing some sort of kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. Um, they also believe two dispensations for salvation, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. They believe in a rapture where people actually disappear into heaven, leaving others still alive here on earth. You know when it says the dead in Christ will rise and so on and so forth, they take that to, to mean some people just disappear. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they believe the millennium on earth will be marked by a, a return of, Jew, of, the, of the Jewish temple and temple worship. And there'll be a great war, great religious war. Some of the proponents of this uh, teaching, the Schofield Reference Bible, if you have a, a Schofield Reference Bible, the notes in the Schofield Reference Bible promote dispensational premillennialism. Uh, the Ryrie Study Bible, same thing. Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, probably the most popular writer, when he came out with that book, this is what he's talking about. Uh, the Dallas Theological Seminary, you know, you hear people, he graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. It's a very prestigious school, but they teach this here. Uh, the Left Behind movies, the Left Behind series and the movies, you know, and the license plates, you know, if I'm not here, you know, I've, I've, been, you know, I've been taken up. Uh, mostly evangelical and charismatic churches, like Pentecostal churches, stuff like that. Much of their preaching and teaching revolve around this idea. A lot of their sermons and series always talk about the end times and you know, different features of the rapture. They spend a whole lot of time on that. So that's dispensational premillennialism. The next one is historic premillennialism. These people teach that when Jesus returns, He will establish a millennial, in other words, a thousand years between the first resurrection and the second resurrection, an actual thousand years. The final judgment will come at the second resurrection after the thousand years. Some of the features of this position, they believe there'll be a great apostasy and tribulation before Jesus returns. Remember, Jesus says, you won't know when I come. Peace and safety, business as usual. 
But they believed that, oh no, there'll be a great war in you know, the East, the West, you know, and they, they spent a whole lot of time trying to figure out who the protagonists are going to be. The Russians, there was a time when, when Russia was very strong, USSR, oh boy, it's going to be Russia. You know, now, whoops, now it's going to be China. And who knows it's going to be in the future? Um, they believe the kingdom uh, will be revealed and Satan will be bound during an uh, earthly thousand year reign. Massive rebellion before Jesus returns a second time for judgment. So he comes back and he comes back again a second time for judgment. Proponents of this teaching, the Fuller Theological Seminary, an, another very prestigious school. If you have a master's or a PhD from Fuller, you're, you, know, you can get a lot of money as a, as a minister, you know what I'm saying, in, 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 in uh, denominational churches. It's a very, very prestigious place. Also George E. Ladd, a commentary on Revelation. Third one, third position. Again, I'm really summarizing here is just, remember we said there's dispensational and then there's historic premillennialism. This is post-millennialism, third. These people generally believe that the millennial age begins gradually as the gospel is preached. They believe that the church exercises its authority in financial and political ways on the earth as a sign of the supremacy of the kingdom. People who believe in post-millennialism are really involved in politics and business. They march in the street with signs. They get involved in issues. They want to have political power. They believe that the church binds Satan and his influence here on this earth and they believe in a form of Christian theocracy. So for them, you know, it's quite all right to put a lot of money. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a Christian you know, being in politics, you know, but I'm saying for them, this is like a goal. This is a strategy. Proponents of this teaching, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Pat Robertson, probably a little more familiar name, right? He, he ran for president, yeah, post-millennial. They believe uh, that being involved in politics and exercising you know, a temporal power in the, in the service of the church you know, is, the, is the way to go. And then you have a millennialism, a millennialism. A millennialist believe that the thousand years refers to the time between Jesus' initial appearance, you know, when He came and He died on the cross, and his second and final return at the end of the world. That's the millennial. That's the thousand years. A millennials believe that a thousand years is a symbolic Jewish numerology. It's symbolic. The Jews believed numbers had values. Three represented God. Four represented the world, you know, north, south, east, west. Seven was an important number because it was the combination of God and His creation. 10 was important because it referred to something which is perfectly mature. So the 10 commandments, the 12 tribes, four times three, you know, those combination of numbers. The thousand year reign, 10 times 10 times 10, a thousand years. What does that say? A perfect time that only God knows. A perfect time when everything will mature. Okay. The Jews did not think that a thousand years meant a thousand numerical years. They understood that it was a perfect time. I mean, 10 was a perfect thing. A hundred was perfection upon perfection. So a thousand was like, only God knows. And so for amillennials, a thousand years is between the time of Jesus when He comes and dies on the cross, resurrects, there's the beginning, the, the, the gospel is preached. And when he returns, that period, that's, we're living in the millennial now. We're in the thousand years now. Why? Because the church has been established. So not literally a thousand years, but a symbolic time between the two appearances. Also, Jesus established the kingdom when He came and the kingdom grows through the preaching of the gospel until His return. He established the kingdom. We're in the kingdom, we are the kingdom. Some of the features, well, some of the things we don't have, there is no rapture, like in the way that you know, Pentecostals believe. 
there is no tribulation. We don't believe you know, the great war is going to point. We know Jesus is coming because north is against south or whatever. We don't. We believe what Paul tells us. Peace and safety. Things are just going to be like they always are. There'll be wars, there'll be tornadoes, there'll be floods, there'll be killing, there'll be good acts, there'll be people having babies, there'll be houses being built and good deeds being done, whatever. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of all of that, tick, it's done. We believe that, the, when I say we, amillennialists believe that uh, the kingdom is represented by the church here on earth. And at Jesus' return, the world will end, the wicked will be judged, the saints will be with Christ in the new heaven and earth forever. Proponents of this teaching, actually the majority of Christianity, Catholics, Roman Catholics, this is what they, they're amillennials. Some of the writers, J.I. Packard, R.C. Sproul, Stafford North, one of our people, of course. Churches of Christ, mainly, I would say, but you'd agree, mainly are a millennials, we believe, in this particular uh, position. Okay, so those are the four positions. So you've gotten today some of the mentions of the second coming in various places, the nine epistles where Paul mentions this and all the references, and the four positions on the second coming of Jesus, the four major uh, positions. Now, let's see. Um, the notes, uh, and this is for folks that are watching this online or who will be watching it on video, you can get uh, special notes at bibletalk.tv slash eschatology dash chart. And Hal has some of these notes. You know the four major positions that I summarized for you? I have those in a much longer article for you to add to your, to your notes. Okay, you can add to that. So if that intrigues you, what, what I've been talking about, the notes that you're getting now will uh, kind of fill all that up. All right, so that's the end of the series. I want to thank everybody for hanging in there for six months, 24 uh, lessons on this. And I hope that uh, your faith has been um, I hope that your faith has been strengthened and your knowledge improved. Thank you very much.